Hello and welcome to Little Things with Amber L.B. Swenson. Today's episode is called Change the Narrative. And I cannot get over how excited I am for this episode. I think it has the potential to really change our life if we take this seriously. But first, let me tell you a little bit about me. I have been writing and teaching Bible studies for the past 15 years. I've worked with women, youth, Sunday school. I've been blogging for Time of Grace since 2017. I've written two books for them. Really what you need to know is that I love the Lord and I love the Word of God. And I find that the deeper I go into the Word of God, the more astounded I am that He loves us and that He notices us and that He cares so deeply about our lives. And my role is really to get people into the Word and to show them how awesome it is and to really get them to a place that they want to know and love God more. That's kind of my mission in life in a nutshell. And first off, I just want to give credit to Louis Giglio. I listened to his sermon called Winning the Battle of the Mind, and it absolutely set me on fire. And um, so that's where... I am um, drawing some of the inspiration for this from. And then I've also been in the middle of this intense Bible study. I just love how all the worlds converge, you know, how different aspects of your life come together into this just um, to really make some points that are so impactful for your life. So I've been doing this intense Bible study with seven or eight women from my church. And um, I mean, it's going to take us years, three to five years to get through. We're just going through it super slowly and we're, you know, digging into scripture and really I'm trying to get a a grasp on what God is trying to teach us at each point. And um, so we started (laughs) where you always start um, in the book of Genesis with the creation. And we move from creation into the fall, into sin. And one of the things that we studied was Satan. And you might say, why study Satan? Well, because you want to know your enemy, right? I mean, it is so good to know Satan's goal. What is Satan's goal? Well, he's trying to turn us from God. The book of Revelation says he was thrown down to the earth to lead the whole world astray. And Jesus said he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Well, it's important that we understand that's Satan's goal. That's what he's trying to do is turn believers from God and keep believers in unbelief. And what's his strategy? His strategy is deception. He twists the truth. He plants doubt. Look at how he came to Eve in the garden and said, did God really say? He tries to make us believe that God is holding out on us, that God really doesn't have our best interest in mind. Look at how Adam and Eve were living in perfection. (laughs) They weren't missing out on anything. And yet Satan said, you know, God knows if you eat of this fruit, that you will know the difference between good and evil. Yeah, you're right. Um, Adam and Eve didn't know evil, and it was a good thing. But Satan made it sound as if God was holding out on Adam and Eve, when the truth is, Satan tries to steal all the good blessings that God would give us. And he tries to to dirty them and muddy them and keep us from them by any means possible. So, um, you know how I've, I've explained this before. Um, the rules are sort of like a fence, okay? So they keep evil out and they keep the good in. Just imagine um, if you're a mom with children, young children, you have that fence around your yard. Why? Well, because you don't want any stray dogs coming in and you don't want your kids, your young children, to get out of the fence yard where they might, you know, walk into a street and get run over. Um, So that fence serves two purposes. It keeps the bad out. It keeps the good in. 
Well, that fence is really a good illustration for God's commands. God's commands are put in place to keep us in the right boundaries. So if we follow God's commands, we're not going to wander into the area where we can get hurt. And God's commands also keep us from letting evil influences in. So the fence is really there to serve a good purpose in our life. But of course, Satan's job is to try to convince us just the opposite. Satan wants us to think that God is holding out on us, that um, you are missing out if you're not having sex with everyone in your life, whether it's premarital sex or um, an affair if you're married. He wants you to think that you're missing out if you're not out partying and living the good life. He wants you to think that the rules are just strict and they keep you held in and they are just so, oh, they're just like a prison and you are just missing out on so much. Listen, that's a lie and that's a deception. And on the same point, <laughs> on, he uses that, those commands to also think, Make you try to make you think that no one else is doing what you are doing. No one else is putting this much time and effort into training their kids. No one else is taking care of their elderly parents like you are. No one else has to be in by this curfew. And on and on and on. And what is that? Lies. That is Satan's biggest tool. Lies. In fact, Jesus said he is um, the father of lies. He is a deceiver. That's what he does. You know, when he makes you think that you are the only one going through something, that's just a lie. That's trying to get you to turn from your commitment to Christ and your commitment to the rules that God has put in place and try to shake you out of that. So how do we know? Remember Elijah on that mountain when he went to God and said, look, I have been so zealous for you, and now I'm the only one left. And what did God say? Elijah, (laughs) there are 7,000 in Israel. And again, my study Bible points out that, you know, it's a rounded number. Um, Doesn't mean 7,000 on the nose, but seven, as we know, is the number of completeness. So there are many people in Israel who have not bowed down to Baal. Just because you don't see it, just because you don't know about it, doesn't mean it's not true. And that's how it is for all of us. We are never the only one. There are faithful Christians all throughout the world. But Satan tries to make us feel as if we are alone. So what is the solution? How do we combat All that Satan would throw at us are his manipulations, his lies, the seeds of doubt that he plants. Well, you know how it is with um, money, how people hold it up to the light to see if it has that watermark on it, to see if it's counterfeit or real. The same is true for everything that Satan throws our, our way. We have to hold it up to the light. We have to compare it to the truth of the Bible. All day, every day, we're bombarded with information, and we have to decide what to do with that, what, with that information. And if we're totally honest, I'm going to be a little brutal here. If we're totally honest, sometimes we sort of like to make our home with the devil. Look, um, the songs that you're listening to, if those songs are all about having it my way, and oh man, it's all about a party, and give me one more beer, and, you know, forget the world, and I'm going to do what I want to do, whatever, um, you're sort of um, taking part in Satan's lies, right? That's not, that's not the messages that we hear in the Bible. Um, the things that we watch on TV, sometimes we like to see some good violence. We, we love to see a little skin. We um, don't mind that people are using God's name in vain or that they're using language that is um, repulsive to God. We sort of like watching those shows. Or how about the gossip? How often don't we partake in the gossip? And we just love to hear what um, someone else has done or how somebody else has fallen or whatever. Um, That is basically 
instead of holding up those truths to the light and saying, no, I don't want any part of that, we're more or less saying, Satan, you're right. There is some pleasure in following you for a while. And, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and um, make my home with you for a bit because this is fun. I enjoy this. So I think first we have to recognize that sometimes we prefer the lies of Satan. And let's just call out a few of those lies that are so prevalent even among Christians. First of all, you deserve this. Oh, that line just makes, makes me bristle every time I hear it. Because what does the Bible tell us? The Bible says all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So what do we deserve? We deserve hell. But thanks be to God, Jesus, um, you know, paid the price in our place so we don't have to go to hell. But when we say, oh, you deserve this or you deserve that or you should really do this, you deserve that, that those words aren't actually biblical. (laughs) How about you're good enough? Don't worry about it. Well, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, whoever breaks the law at one point has broken the whole law. You know, we can really convince ourselves that we're good enough. We don't have to worry about all the sin in our life because, you know, we do pretty good, all things considered. Well, what does James say? James says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Why is it important to deal with all the sin in our lives? Because sin uncontrolled can really get carried away and drag us to a place that we don't want to be. And so, yeah, you might be pretty good. I might be pretty good. That's, that's good. That's great. And we're never going to reach perfection. I am not trying to lay a guilt trip on you at all by any stretch of the imagination right now. God demanded perfection of Jesus and Jesus fulfilled it. So that price has been paid. I'm saying Satan really tries to convince us that those things that we do, that we take part in our little pet sins, they're not that bad. Sure, I might overeat a bit, but you know, I'm not as bad as that person. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but is it affecting my health? Is it affecting my attitude? Would I rather (laughs) go hide out in a corner and eat a bag of M&Ms than deal with my kids? I can assure you there have been times that the answer to that is yes. So that is not the godly thing. You know, God would prefer that I deal with my children instead of hiding in the corner eating excess calories. Um, Have you ever said, I just give up? Like, I can't, I can't even do this anymore. I, I give up. I'll never get out of this mess. So why, why even try? Well, what does God's word say? It says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. Don't fall into dismay, dis- despair. I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. God is trying to say, listen, when you are at the point of thinking you need to just give up, you call up to me. And Jesus said, faith the size of a mustard seed. A tiny pin dot of a seed can move mountains. You just need to go to God and trust that he will help you. And you put one foot in front of the other. Um, James Foss said, The evil influence of Satan would destroy any hope we have in overcoming our mistakes. He would have us feel that we are lost and there is no hope. In contrast, Jesus reaches down to lift us up. And that is, again, God saying, do not be afraid. I am with you. Don't be dismayed. Satan wants us to be bound in our sin. But God is in complete opposition to that. He says, no, I'm here. I've overcome. Jesus said in this world, you're going to have trouble. But don't worry, I've overcome the world. Since Jesus has overcome it, we can go to him in our weakness. We can go to him in our trouble, in our mess, and say, God, help me. And he is right there every time. The Apostle Paul said, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You want to know how you destroy the lies of Satan? You take captive every 
thought. It looks like this. You see that hot guy on the screen and you instantaneously can go one of two ways. Jesus said, anyone who looks at a woman, or in this case, a man, lustfully has already committed adultery with him or her in his heart. So you can go down the path of lust, or you can take that, ca- that thought captive and say, I'm not going to look at that person lustfully. I- I'm not going to do that. I'm not going there. I'm not going any further than to notice that they are good looking. God warned Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Master it or it will master you. We can take our thoughts captive and we can stay away from sin or we can choose to let them run rampant in our mind and we can follow them down the path to sin. It really is up to us. I can't go in your mind and take your cap- your thoughts captive. I can suggest to you, I can pray for you, I can tell you when you come to me and say, I feel worthless, I can say that is not from God. How do I know? He told you in his, all throughout scripture, he shows us how much he loves his people and all that he has done for his people. So I know, I know that that's a lie, but you have to take the, the thought captive. That's your job. And to do that, we have to be in scripture so that we know how to combat Satan and what passages to use. Um, There's a meme that said, God already destroyed who is trying to destroy you. Listen, Satan is not more powerful than God. In the garden, God said, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Who is God talking about? Well, Satan gets to strike Jesus' heel. He lashed out quite a bit. But Jesus, he crushed Satan's head. And you might notice that living things cannot live without their head. I mean, a person, once they're beheaded, life is gone. The power is gone. Jesus crushed Satan's head. He destroyed the threat of the devil. In fact, 1 John 3, 8 said, Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. (laughs) That battle's been won. We do not have to think that we are powerless to do this. In fact, we're told, resist the devil. He will flee from you. We see that in the account of Joseph. Joseph ran. When he was tempted to go to bed with Potiphar's wife, he, he ran. And he got out of there. You resist the devil, the devil has no power over you. Um... Stop. We all have to stop giving Satan control of our mind. We have to stop. Um, Well, Louis Giglio put it so beautifully. He said, change the playlist. You know, the thoughts running in your mind, you don't have to let the devil have his way with what plays in your head. Change the playlist. Put the things of God in your head. Again, like I said, we can choose to listen to the things of of Satan. We can choose to watch the things we shouldn't be watching. We can choose to listen to the things we shouldn't be listening to. We can choose to make our home amongst sinners and partake of all the sins that they are partaking of. Or we can be putting the things of God in our head. We can be singing songs, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. We can be listening to God's word. We can be reading God's word. We can be studying God's word. And again, if I haven't made this point before, I um, have done a great disservice. But honestly, the people that I study the Bible with are the people who I'm closest to. And I, my husband and I have been in in-home Bible study for years. They're my our, our closest friends. I've had several Bible studies. I've been teaching Bible studies since 2004, and I've taught at multiple churches. Um, sometimes I've had a, a, a study with three churches where the women from three different congregations come together. I've met many women. Studying the Bible together, man, it just bond you to each other. You you get into these conversations and you you learn and you grow and um, what a beautiful way to share life. And even in the last um, several months when I've had Zoom studies with other 
women um, from all across the country. Being in the word together is incredibly encouraging. Uh, if, if you are missing out on that, find somebody to study the Bible with. Um, ask your pastor where uh, a Bible study is meeting or how you can get into a Bible study. If there isn't one at your church, ask him to start one. Um, my guess is that your pastor is going to say, oh, well, you know, we have this one and this one and this one and this one, or which one would you like to do? Um, you get into the Word and surround yourself with Christians and um, let that be the narrative in your mind. Charles Spurgeon said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Listen, Satan is so good at manipulating the truth. And how does he do that? He, he puts truth in and then he twists the truth or he manipulates the truth or he has an almost truth and he sucks us in with just a little shred of truth. We have to be strong enough in the Lord to recognize when Satan is trying to pull us away with that little shred of truth surrounded with a whole lot of deception. Ephesians 6 gives us just the perfect way to battle Satan. The Apostle Paul said this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Can you imagine for one minute um, someone going into battle and saying, you know, I think today I'm just going to wear my shorts and flip-flops. I know that I'm going against people with machine guns. And um, I know that they're sophisticated fighters. But I'm guessing this is good enough. We wouldn't do that, right? So this says to put on the full armor. And he goes on to tell us what that is. He says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Again, it is so important to know your enemy and know the strategy. (laughs) Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. That belt of truth is going to keep you from falling into the deceptions of Satan. You need the truth. And where are you going to find the truth? In the word. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is the word. We're told that in John chapter 1. So that belt of truth, that's us being in the word. That's how we are putting on our armor to defeat Satan. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. Where do we get our righteousness? Well, from Jesus. We need to be walking with Jesus. Jesus fulfilled everything in our place. He kept every command. He lived a perfect life so that his righteousness is now our righteousness. And your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Again, how are you going to get away from the traps of Satan that would, you know, pull you into Satan's camp? The gospel on your feet is going to have you running away from Satan. You are going to be able to defeat Satan with that gospel that is going to tell you the truth. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Rest in him. That shield is going to keep you from all that Satan would throw your way. When he throws those little whispers your way, you are worthless. You can't get through this. You are in too big of a mess. You are in over your head. How are, how are you ever going to get out of this? That faith in Christ is going to go back to those passages in the word and you are going to say, Satan, wrong, because God's word says this. And all those flaming arrows are going to fall when they hit the shield. They'll, They'll do no harm to you. And it says that with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation. So that helmet of salvation, again, you, what's the most important thing? Your salvation is sealed in Christ. So protect the head. You, you can go without an arm. You can live without a leg. 
But you know, if your head is chopped off, you're done. So the most important thing is that you remember that your salvation is Christ. Satan cannot take that away from you. He can try. He can work really hard to make you doubt it. He can't take that away. You need the helmet of salvation arm on. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Man, arm yourself with the spirit. Let him fight your fights. If you are feeling it and you are feeling it hard and heavy, the battle all around you, Holy Spirit, come help me out here. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do this alone. God says, you call on me and I will be there. I will answer you. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. You know, this is a deception that I fall for way too easily. I am so sidetracked from time to time. I can start my day thinking I'm going to do A, B, C, D, and E. And halfway through my day, I've been pulled into this thing and pulled into that thing and pulled into that thing. And Satan knows if he can just distract me, he can keep me from doing the most important thing. The most important thing I can do each day, be in the word and pray for all the saints teach the word, live the word, Um, make sure, make other people aware, encourage the saints. Those are the things I want to be doing, but Satan is so good at distracting me. I have to remember to pray in the spirit on all occasions and ask God to help me keep my focus so I can produce the most fruit that I am capable of producing. So I hope that this has... um, been beneficial to you and that you can maybe um, change the narrative that plays out in your mind. And again, I cannot say loud enough (laughs) to go and watch Louis Giglio's sermon on winning the battle of the mind because it absolutely um, just struck a nerve with me and how often I fall for Satan's little whispers. And so um, let's all try to do better. Let's Let's meet Satan and fight him and resist him and walk away from him. This has been little things because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things. Don't forget to pray for us at Time of Grace. And if you are able, send in your financial contribution so we can share this message and others like it with many more people.